And I better take these headphones off because the cord's too short. <laughs> yes. So, I'm Jim Meadows, and it's July 23rd, and I'm here in Flanagan, Illinois, with Delbert Augsburger. It's Delbert J. Augsburger. Right. <laughs> and um, you're a you're you're a native of around here. You grew up in, in a in, in a farm in Flanagan. Right. Just two and a half miles outside of Flanagan. Okay. Big um, family. Yes, so quite a bit of. Uh, I think we were, well, there was ten of us, and four boys and six boys and four girls. Where were you in line in the family? Uh, right in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, four four older than how many that would make younger, but. <clears throat> so as as far as, as as far as you and your brothers, were you in the were you the middle brother as well? Yeah, I got uh, two brothers older, and uh, I've had two brothers younger, Joe and Clayton, Donald, three uh, three brothers younger. Mm -hmm. And Mennonite family, so you Mennonite, all grown well, up. brought up Mennonite, rural Mennonite church, mm -hmm. all the Mennonite church. Now Mennonites historically what they call a peace church, as I understand. Right. Well, that was that was they didn't believe in. Ah, uh, that time we never far the theoret uh, the beliefs go, or you know we didn't pay that too much attention to them. Then we just went to church and did this, mm -hmm. and and my parents never my dad never really he was kind of a soft-spoken man and he never made any demands on us we kind of went our own way but we did of course have to go to church every Sunday and all this but when we come to the decision of going into the service well my dad was under quite a stress uh, my mother had died uh, when I was a senior in high school was, this was only two years uh, the war was already just starting when my mother died and he was left with the family and we still had four or five of us at home yet, or six of us home, I think there's only two left. And so that put a, quite a burden on him and, and he had a lot of problems at that time. And we kind of went our own way. He didn't have time to really make any decisions for us. We had to make them all ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't finish high school, you know. And, and then I, I'm not working on, at that time too, there wasn't that much work to do uh, on the farm. so. I did start working for a plumber in, in Flanagan, and so I, I I worked at the plumber for a year, and then and then when I was going before I went to service, I already had the job at the hardware store, which we did plumbing and heating. Mm -hmm. So actually, when it had my on a resume that I was a farm hand, but I was actually already working in the uh, hardware store, the hardware business in heating, and it, well not air conditioning. I didn't do air conditioning until I got out. Service and went to school on, on my GEI bill, but so so I was actually wasn't my profession was never really farming. I just grew up on a farm basically. But you were listed as a farmer, and you got a farm deferment for. Yes, uh, at that time, agriculture was one of the important uh, jobs. Anyhow, that you that you would be deferred if you was needed. Uh, as a job, I don't know what they would call it, preferred job or essential job. Mm -hmm. And farm, farming was an essential job at that time. So if you had, so, it, but the small farm that we were on, uh, it would only be big enough for one deferment. And so uh, when we were, because it was only 18 months between my other brother that, that went in. And so actually, uh, well, when it was my time to go in, and then, uh, and then uh, I got deferment for for a, a year or two, almost two years that I got. Otherwise, I would have been in the service before that. See, uh, but I got a farm deferment, and then I got the younger brother going up. So then he took over the deferment. Then, I, then when my when went for my physical, I didn't have a deferment anymore, and that's why I was, mm -hmm. I was conscripted that to go in. Now, all, did all of your brothers go in as well? The, just the three of us was at the, during the war. Okay, there's three of you total. There's that went in at the one time. Yeah. Okay, so so the whole family. I'm gonna make sure I have the math. It's a uh, family of five, well, four six, brothers. Uh, and, actually, six boys six all together. Boys. My older brother Merlin went in as, as conscientious objector. 
Merlin Augsburger. Merlin was my older brother. He was the first one who went in. It was drafted as a CO. He went in there. And what did he do then? Uh, well, he, he, was, uh, he was in constructive service. I think he was in a forest service for a while. And then we got a letter from him. Uh, he said, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I can't live on my good looks or something like that. He's going to join the service. <laughs> so so he, 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 while he was in the CO camp, he, he signed up and, and joined the, uh, well, the cut time they called it Calvary, which, of course, he was kind of a horseman in that, but they didn't really use horses anymore. But that, that was the name. Of, I think they used horses for parades and stuff like that. But then, of course, it just was right down to just more or less in an infantry unit that he went into. And then, and then he got sent over. He settled the, over in the uh, Philippines for a while, and he went through several campaigns over there. So, and then my other brother, Dean, before I, he was in, a, not even a year before I was, not quite. And he's 18 months older than I. And then he went through Patton's army all through Europe and that, and in the armored division. And then, then I had the younger brother. Of course, the war was long down then, but he was in service for a certain length of time. Then the other younger brother, but they were still being drafted yet for several more years, Brother Joe. So all four? All except, all except one of them. Uh, but he had bad eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, his sight was that good. Uh, he didn't get in. But, okay. uh, all the rest of it. But but we was only it was only the well the four of us in on, on one time. Okay. But in total, there were there was there was five. Uh, five of five yeah. of your brothers are, are the five of you. Yeah. Were, all went in except for the, for the sixth one with brother the, with yeah, had, had the, had the uh, bad eyes. One of them was a conscientious objector first. Yeah, but he, then, yeah and then he changed over okay. to, to the regular army. You were drafted. Was everybody in your family who went in drafted? Oh, yeah. We wouldn't ever think about uh, enlisting at that time. That would have been a, not that we didn't want to, but that, you know, if you, of course, we had the conscientious uh, objection uh, seen behind us, you know, thinking about it. So we just never went against the church and have it. But we was drafted, it wasn't quite a, a choice, you know. Well, was that, was that something that all of you were talking about or, or, or thinking about at the time? About yeah, you know, well, I had, you, yes, I had quite a, some friends that went NCO, you know, and conscientious objector. But I, I, I made a little, dis, you know, I had a little decision for a while, but I had enough uh, Bible studies that I remember one. Uh, one thing that Jesus uh, was asked this question. Uh, he, he was given a coin and, and uh, a denarii, I think they called it then. And uh, the, somebody asked him uh, about paying homage to Caesar. And he had this, he had the, uh, he looked at the coin and it must have been, the coin must be something like the coin we have now, like we have in God we trust on the one side in the picture of the present. And he showed the picture, and he said, "He said, well, look at the one side." He said, uh, to, uh, "He turned to one side, and he said, render, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and the things of God, the things that are God, and turn the other side of the coil, coin.'" So I thought that that right there was a, a commandment, you know, that you, whatever the government asked you to do, that was a, a thing you should do. Was that a difficult? point of view to have in the community? Uh, not too much. Uh, no, but like I said, my dad never pressured us. We had our own choice. And, uh, and it was the reason why, of course, I did it probably one reason why I want, always wanted to fly. <laughs> and uh, as, a, as a kid on the farm, uh, I always uh, had the idea of, you know, I, someday I'd, I'd want to I'd fly and, and, of course, to get the opportunity and uh, even at home, we didn't have many toys or not, but we made a look like an airplane of a plank and some wheels and put it on the log with two sticks on it and pull it behind the buggy down the field like, like he was taking off flying. Uh, that was one thing. And then Charles Lindbergh was one of my f heroes. 
when I was growing up, and I always uh, admired him, you know, and that was the thing. And I so so actually I, I thought, well, I think probably I, I thought maybe I would get in and get some pilot training. Yeah. And as it turned out, I did get my pilot's license through the through the army, but not directly after I got discharged. I had some schooling. I had four four years of, of school coming, and so I took a year and a half out of getting my private pilot license. And, and then I, I went to other school. I went to heating air conditioning school down in St. Louis. So. Now, at the same time as, and, and of course, as you know, during that same mm -hmm. time, I guess, when you were just turning yeah. about 20 when you went in? Yeah. Um, that just, uh, it was in the middle fun. of the war. Everybody yeah. was talking and thinking and worrying about the war. Right. So, so, so everybody must have had points of view about what to do. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm not just too sure uh, why the, you know, the, the big decision was. To me, it wasn't too much of a decision. I know some of the older people were already in uh, CO, but, but see, a lot of them, it was also, we had the uh, option of, of going uh, non-combatant and get into the uh, medics. And that was kind of my idea when I went in, to get into the medics. But when it came up, going down the line, had a chance to take the Air Force test, I, I took it. Okay. And now you had said before, it was, was it an older brother or a younger brother who did become a CO? The older brother, the first one that went in. Okay, so he sounded like he yeah. was the one who was most affected by that. Yeah, kind of he, I, th I think the the older one was, and and not only was he a, had more of the uh, mindset of that because he was working for one of our devout church members at the time that we thought he was one of the deacons of the church, and he was working for him as a farm hand at that time when he went in, and that might have affected his decision a little bit too, going in mm -hmm. as a seal. Yeah, how did, did, was, was it tougher for someone being a CO? I mean, in the midst of, in, in the midst yeah, of? Yeah, they were looking, you call them yellow bellies, things like that. Uh, you know, they, they, got the, they got the name as a, as a total run as a community. That it, it was, it, it was. Uh, that would happen in Flanagan? Yeah. Uh -huh. I've, I've heard them. Even, even with the Mennonite church? Right, being, being prominent. I would think we had three Mennonite churches outside of town, but of course we, of course we had the two Lutheran church here and the Catholic church in town. Uh, the, the Mennonite church was prominent uh, south, south in the churches out in that area. Okay. But it's still something that they had to put up with. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was that, you, you said he had changed his mind, was that part of the reason when, when he decided to Well, I don't, I'm not too sure. Like to say, his conviction probably wasn't that strong either, you know. Uh, he was, like I said, where he, he worked for the, the man he worked for was probably was one of the strong reasons. Because I know, I know my dad never said, you, you should do this or you should do that. He let us have our own choice. In fact, the, in fact, it was never brought up. He never seemed to have any... <laughs> Strong opinion either way no. as to far he, as what you're He must decision. not have because I, I don't remember him ever, ever saying anything against, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not going. Did you ever hear from your church about it? Yes, after I got out of the service, uh, there was talk in this church about, uh, about letting us come back into church, you know, how we were going to, how they was going to make it right for us to get back into the congregation. Well, at that time, <clears throat> I really didn't care too much about the congregation because I was going with my wife Betty Jo, and uh, we was, <clears throat> and she was a Methodist. Of course, the Methodist was quite a bit against conscription too, but not as strong as the as the uh, Mennonites were. And uh, but then, so it was no brainer for me. Uh, but I think it was just before we got married, the minister come around and have a paper to sign. Uh, that to get to make it right with the congregation, so you could get back into full membership. Well, that didn't make me a difference. In that time, I'm not in a position to argue. It didn't make I was make any difference. Well, I I said you know at the time, uh, 
I said, well, I, do, I, I did, I'll agree that I did go against the teaching of the church, but not because I thought it was wrong, you know, but uh, other teaching was all. So I, I, I signed it, my wife never liked it too good that I did, did sign that, but I, I never went back to the church after that, I joined the Methodist church. So you've been a Methodist <laughs> since then? Yeah. Okay. But I'm still, you know, I still think a lot of the church, uh, uh, we, we still do a lot with the church out there. And, Mm -hmm. And a lot of cousins belong to the church out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you went, you know, once 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 you signed up, they, mm -hmm. where, where did they take you to first? Uh, first thing I went to uh, uh, Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, basic training. And that's another thing that when I first went into the service, you know, we didn't think too much about just going into the service. It was a big, a big step, but the first thing when we went through the first door, the big sign on the door said, kill or be killed. You know, and that kind of gives you a jolt right there. And, uh, and, and so that, that got you thinking a little bit on well, what's, what's we're getting into here? Uh, because, you know, you never think about killing uh, or anything like that. But, but that, this was the mindset that, you know, that you had to, had to have kind of that, uh, when you go in to serve, and that's what they wanted you to, to be, you know, uh, that you, it was a serious business. That's the only time we realized how serious what you was getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so this is why we say now, uh, we have, uh, have the little tr trouble, not too much, but we say uh, uh, we have different, well, I'm pretty strong with the Legion, we do a lot of talking, and, and there's so many of the people that went in the service didn't get into combat, you know. And uh, they feel a little bit, well, they don't want to say anything. They don't think they did their part. But us that was in combat, we say, that's a, don't make a bit of difference if he's in combat or what you saw. Or you, was, you spent your time when you was, under, you was under control. You was under control of the government. You had nothing to say. You did what they told you to do. And combat or non-combat didn't make any difference. I mean, they, he has, the person that didn't see combat has as much right as what the person that saw combat. And I think that's the mindset of most veterans, that they don't, you know, we all, all the same. We don't treat one any different than the other. We, we just happen to have a luck and, like say, you did what they told you to do. You had no save your own anymore. Now, nowadays, they do get to sign up maybe uh, what they want to take. Some of them want to take something with computers and things like that. I don't know if kids that do that. And they might not get to do exactly what they want to do, and they're unhappy about. It. Well, getting going over to yeah. gunnery school, well, yeah. how much how much of that was your decision as compared to the? Uh... I, I had no decision. All right, all right. When I went down to, uh, that's another thing. It was a little bit of disappointment when we went, when I first got into basic training. Then we start doing a lot of testing, yeah. And then, uh, well, besides our just manual arms and stuff, we Air Force didn't have a real strong basic training like manual arms we didn't know what we did a lot of marching and that but then we'd go we'd go on a lot of a lot of testing and then they put up on the board uh, to be uh, accepted into the cadet corps you know and then you go up every day we'd go up and look on the board uh, if our names was up there what happened to it and then my when my name came up and it says uh, if there's a different category uh, passed and, and not non-committed they had it. Anyhow, they made me feel like I passed it, all the tests and everything, but right then it said non-committed, which meant they didn't need, a, they didn't need any more pilots at that time. <laughs> we, need, we need more gunners. So uh, after they said non-committed, that means I didn't know what they do until the sergeant called us to formation. Lift a bunch of names off if you're going to the gunnery school. And he said, well, I wish I was going with you. Yeah, he was, and so, uh, but that was the only first time that I really know that I wasn't going to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. But it, it was no big disappointment because I, you know, I was going to gunnery school. That was okay. You still get to fly even if you aren't flying the plane. Is that how you thought? Of <laughs> well, it? yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just an excitement, you know. If I'm you, you know, you you like to do something, uh, experience. Yeah, I well, think so. What was what was the training like for the gunnery school? Uh, they started you off pretty in a pretty fast training. The first time we first time we went up, we had a B-17 there, and the first the first once we had training on, they did a lot on the movies and videos of uh, 
of what we're supposed to do and that. And uh, and uh, but the first the first time we went up on the plane in the first plane ride I had, uh, we had the open windows on the side of the plane and, and we had a tow target up there to shoot at. Uh, why that poor guy was pulling that tow target. But then it, it, it was pretty, oh, pretty bad, a little bit scary. I mean, it got, we, a lot of them got sick, you know, the pretty bouncy plane and you were sitting there and, and uh, shooting that 50 caliber machine gun out of that target. Because we had, we had all the training before the sights. You know, at that time we had the rad sights, you know, how much to lead the plane when they was coming into uh, attack, you know, stuff like that. And uh, and then we had guys get sick with the oxygen mask. We was up the altitude, we had to have oxygen. Some, we, had, we had some poor guys that got thrown up when they had have an oxygen mask. I remember seeing them laying there in the, uh, the belly of the plane there, sick, with, with the, trying to keep the oxygen mask on. And, now, you never had that trouble? No, I never. I, I always got kind of woozy, but I never did get sick. Okay. I, I never had an appetite. When we get back from a mission flying, I never had an appetite. Of course, of course, when we got back from the mission, we always they always give us a shot of scotch. You know, those brilliant. They make you feel up, pep you up a little bit. Now, the planes you were training in, what type were they? B-17s. And you showed me a picture which <laughs> had the gunner in sort of like a little bubble. Well, that was a ball tour. Uh, when ball tour. when they uh, when we went through a training. When we first went to a gunnery school, they didn't tell you where you're going to be in the plane. They, in fact, you uh, you practice above ground. On you had your tour, uh, just a tour it up there where you where you shot at a moving target on the track, and uh, and then I didn't know until we went to uh, Las Vegas and formed our crew that I was going to be a ball turret gunner, and I was kind of my size, I think, because uh, I was thinking the shortest guy on the crew. They had the crew all formed where I met, I met, I didn't know any of the other people, and then I went to gunnery training, but we, we met these, got together in, in Las Vegas, and and, this, and then we start training as a crew, and that was my job. Then. So what's it like being, you're, mm -hmm. you're sort of like in the bottom of the plane? Yeah. And it's sort of like the ground is there below you? Well, yeah, well, it, you know, you, it's movable, and there's plex, mostly plexiglass, yeah. you know, but, but you can see right down your gun, your Controls are up here. You can you can go up and down and around any place you, you so, want. To, you know. So the, it gives the gun a lot of flexibility. The, 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 the guns moved with your turret, actually, mm -hmm. actually. And then and then they had a they, the the uh, it was a, uh, uh, the, I think Sperry Ball designed this site that it looked like a lot of the video cameras we have now. That when you when you look through there, uh, you, you you seen the hairs. Uh, the little arms in there, and you can control them arms about uh, where you had to frame the attacking plane. And if you, you, if you get, if you could get that plane tracked in between these two grids you had in there, and as the plane coming in, if you could follow that, and then of course you had your triggers on each one, and and they could tell if, whether you had that plane or whether you was uh, on target enough to hit that plane. In fact, in, in gunnery, we had that when we start having live planes attacking us. We had P-47s, and we even had some uh, uh, some B-25s, two-engine plane attacking us because they're pretty short a plane. Anyhow, uh, when we when we get down on the ground, and then they was taking a picture, you, they had film of that, and they see how you did, uh, how many hits you had, just by the camera. Okay. So, uh, so you trained you trained on targets on the ground, and then we went up, flew, and and you, then you went up and yeah. shot to the ground from there, and you had to shoot at other planes. Yeah, the planes coming in. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, we had these these guys coming in, but it's just be a, a camera. I mean, we wouldn't be shooting them, but <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, but we had we had these pilots co coming in and, and attacking us as if they were the enemy plane, and then we we they could tell. How, how we could frame that plane coming in, attacking us, how we were on the on the target or not. Now, yes, you know, from what I've heard about being in the position you were, yeah. it's like that's like perhaps one of the most vulnerable parts. Well, of the, plane. It, Is that true? the the I think the most probably the scariest part was I didn't have room for a parachute uh, down there. The uh, other the, the the rest of the crew had yeah, chutes. see they had they had the parachute. Of course, the pilots they sat on their chute and and the other ones uh, uh, the the uh, tail gunner, he ha had his chute already snapped on. Uh, the waist gunner, they had the chute that you snap on, you know. And so I, my chute was hanging up there in the plane. 
and uh, if if we were something would happen that I, that with a ball wouldn't move, then I wouldn't get. There was no way I could I could bail out uh, without putting the gun straight down for that little door you had to crawl out. Mm -hmm. If the guns were straight down, then you could go all through that door. So you had to. I I tried a couple of times to have that shoot down there with me, but it was no room. It was, <laughs> no room down there anyhow. But I tried that, but. But then it was only only one time where I really, you know, had to snap the chute on in an emergency that uh, uh, that uh, the pilot called me out because when we had the engine shot out by a couple of engines and we were losing altitude, why so we didn't know he was going to go down or not. So I did get time to get out of the ball uh, and put the chute on. Now is that is that something you worried about? As as I was fine, yes, I thought about that uh, quite a bit of the time. Uh, how am I going to get out of there? Because I could I could open the wheel uh, the the hatch and fall, and fall out, but then I wouldn't have to shoot. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was a little bit worried on that because this electrical system went out, but then you, you wouldn't be able to put that door up into the plane. <laughs> that was a mark. How much of a, was it, was it a thrill for you at the time? Because you said you'd always wanted to fly. Yeah. And there you were, you know, yeah. even in, in training, you were, you were really doing it. Yeah, it was, it, it, it was kind of, I mean, I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the flight as long as it wasn't in combat uh, because it was uh, it was a couple of missions that we flew that I didn't have to get down the ball and you just loafed around the plane like look out the window and get up the nose and watch and stuff like that it was it was quite a was quite a thrill it's a great view from up there yeah, yeah. now how, how long how long were you in training and in, in the uh, oh, no, I got it I got it in the book but it was I would look it up until I went through school. It wasn't that long uh, because the, uh, I went in. I went in, and then we were flying that summer. Uh, so six weeks of basic, and then flying was probably another uh, couple months. And so it, it was. It was probably. I got the the first mission. Then was. Uh, in the fall. So that's the fall of? Of, of, of 44. Fall of 44. 44, yeah. And uh, I'm not too sure what the dates are. But. When you came out of training, did you feel ready? Yeah, I, I, was, I, I thought we had enough training. Yeah, we, it, it was pretty thorough. Uh, you had to pass so much, you know, if you didn't, if, if you didn't get, if you uh, had in the tow target, you had different color. Your your bullets were marked with a different paint, and they could count in there how many hits you had into the into the tow target, uh, and also also the one that I told you the the video that you taking a picture of, uh, when you was when them planes would be attacking uh, dumping planes. They could tell you. Now and was, was, we had a little bit on the rifle. I got we got not much as there uh, because I think they, they put the expert on there on one. I'm not too sure what, what rifle it was, but we had a firing range too that we had to do. Was the standard high to the point that some of the people who went in with you didn't make the grade? Uh, yeah, there was, there was, there was uh, but we never knew why, you know. Uh, first we know, first in training, you know, we never got acquainted too much with the people of training uh, because we weren't, to, you know, we weren't together that much. You group different groups. and. Yeah, uh, your training might be different times, and we never got to be buddies with anybody until we formed our crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, and first thing you know, you just the person was wasn't there with you anymore, but you really never knew why. Okay, so you went from you went from um, Las Vegas um, straight well, over to, to to get over to find over to Europe then. Uh, and another thing that happened, uh, mm -hmm. which which was luck for me, I of course I'd rather flew over. But we went to Kearney, Nebraska, to pick up planes uh, as a fer ferry the, the new planes over because uh, they, they were needed. And but it just happened that we didn't get we didn't get a, a plane. Uh, there wasn't any available, I guess. So our crew was sent by boat. Well, then we took a big train ride to Langley Field, Virginia. We sat we was there for a week or so before we finally got on a boat. Then went overseas. So so we we, we were a couple months behind. 
uh, the other bunch that I trained with mm -hmm. to get into combat, which was lucky because, in fact, on the way over there, the first stop we had in the first night I was in England, uh, one of the one of the stopovers before we went out to the base, was a, one of the kids I was in gunnery school with I was coming back already, and he had already been shot down. Uh, he sprained his ankle or something. When he, he parachuted out anyhow. Anyhow, so so if if it just by making that much difference of the time it took to go over in the boat it was really a blessing for me to not because uh, you know it, it got as the war went on it, we kept having more fighter protection and uh, and and it it got less less German fighters but the flak kept getting heavier because they mm -hmm. kept bringing the pulling the guns back and as you as they pulled them back there was more concentrated like Berlin and Munich and some of them were really, there was really a lot of it. Uh, when, when you say fighter protection, yeah, that's protection for you? Right, we have fighter protection because, see, when I got there, the D-Day was just it was after that, and we start, they used to, fighters could only follow us across the channel, you know, then they'd have to go back to the base, they couldn't go that far. But as soon as, as, soon as we start getting some bases, as, as our army went up into, it through Italy and it got some bases in France, mm -hmm. and then we had fighter bases there, and then they would pick us up after we got across, and they could follow us all the way to the target. That's fighters on the ground. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, that, so the, they the, would be supporting you from uh, the, trucks and tanks, or on the foot, or no? They they were they were uh, they, they they were just air bases where that a fighter air bases, mm -hmm. the P fifty ones, and, and uh, other oh, planes. The planes were P fifty ones. Yeah, they had airfields over there just for fighters. Okay. And then not see the fighter planes weren't in, on the same field where the bombers were. Okay. And then the fighter planes, like I said, they they pick us up as though they could follow us and, and on the target. So that's why we never had that much interference with the Germans. You were you were stationed at Basingbourne, you said. Basingbourne, England. Basingbourne. Yeah, yeah it was about forty miles from London. Okay. Uh, so you would fly missions from there. Yes. Yeah, we never did a landing. We hoped we never had a landing. We thought we did a couple of times, but we always made it back. So in that case, it was once you got the passing born that you you formed a stable crew with another. We we formed the crew in Las Vegas, and we in did, Las Vegas. We we did practice missions in Las Vegas. Uh, <clears throat> they would go up in the the bombardiers. We have the crew, and they have a a mark a circle out there in the desert, and they would have to drop these powder bombs. And which I was in the position on the ball, why I could I could mark the I could see the bomb base and I could follow the bombs down and see what they did, and take a picture of it. Uh, they had pictures on the camera, and then they'd show us uh, after we got up, we'd have a meeting in different rooms, and they show you what your and uh, so so we had quite a few missions out there, like practice missions as a crew. And, and that's the crew that went out to England. Yeah, then we took off to England. We all went to England together. Now that's a that's a different thing than from all the other when you were in training. These are people that you really got to know. I take it. Yeah, after the crew, but yeah, the people I, in training I never got to know. Uh, yeah. I never was that group. Now these were the B seventeen. Yeah. How many people in a crew? Uh, one time there was ten, and then we got down to nine because uh, we didn't need a didn't need a bombardier on every plane. Uh, and we didn't need a navigator on every plane, uh, so uh, so then the, the uh, what they call him a tagalier. That was the the, uh, the nose gunner. Then he didn't, he wasn't a bombardier, but he would drop off of the lead, each each uh, each squadron had a lead plane, and that would have the bombardier in, and then uh, he would he would drop a smoke bomb, and whenever the other planes went over that same spot, then the tagalier would toggle the bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kept less, uh, you know, we only had to have, well, we always had nine, I thought. Uh, but it, we ran a little trouble not having the navigator there, too, when when trying to find our way back after we lost our group, you know, we didn't keep up with our group. We had some engine shot. Uh, we had two engines shot out that mission. It's, it's rolled up in the in the book of, of, of that, uh, on that one mission. And, and, uh, and we didn't know our way back, tried to, uh, I remember asking the radio operator which what our heading was. He didn't know, and the P-51 seen us out there by ourselves, 
Of course, we, <clears throat> in lost altitude, we was pretty low. And he come up the side of us, and I can still get, I still got that memory in my mind of that because I got all the ball because we was, had to get all the ball. We thought we had to bail out anytime. And the P-51s come up behind us, beside of us. The P-51 is the, the the fighter plane. The support. Yeah, you know, the support group. And of course, he knew he was in trouble. We only had two engines, was wasn't running, and uh, and he knew he was going the wrong direction. Uh, we was heading out for Russia, I guess we were. That was way down Pils, Czechoslovakia. Anyhow, uh, uh, he come up behind us, and I remember. Of course, I was like I say, I got out of the ball, put my chute on to go ready to be out, but I was watching what's going on, and uh, and the P-51 come up behind. Him. He had a hard time flying that slow uh, to keep up with. It. To fly that slow, but he was doing mo motions in the cockpit and motion to our pilot, and he was trying to give him, he was trying to give him a, a, he a heading back, and our our pilot thought it was a heading back, and and he was trying to give it the radio frequency, <laughs> yeah, because because he got to talk to that pilot later on, find out what the trouble was, but finally, finally he he just made a big circle around from our tail and and uh, buzzed off and had this direction until he got us until he got us straightened out. And then we made it the right direction. Once they got back over France, and that uh, they pick up landmarks and find the way back to our base, and so we did make it back to the base. You put on a shoot that time. Yeah. Did you ever have to put on a shoot any other time? Oh, uh, only one other time in in, in training I did. Uh, but other than that, I never I never put the shoot. You never had to bail out. No, no. But we had a lot of people that had well, the lucky ones that bailed out. If the plane wasn't hit too bad, they could bail out. Because they had thousands of prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they we were. It was so common to get to bail out and be captured as POW was uh, before we flew the first mission, and that's why I didn't know nothing special to get the rank. Uh, they made you a buck sergeant before you flew the first mission, uh, because the Germans respected military. And you wanted to be caught by uh, the army and not civilians. If you were shot down, the first thing they'd tell you to do was turn yourself in to the military if you could, because they would respect the army and put you in the, the, the prisoner camp. Because the civilian caught, they had lots of them. A lot of the farmers and that were killed. I mean, lynched the, the flyers if they's out there. They kill them with pitchforks or anything. Uh, so, so this is why. So then, the latter part of the war, they furnished each one of us with a 45 caliber a sidearm, and the sidearm wasn't for the German army; it was for civilians to protect yourself against civilians. Your unit, I mean, your crew never had to face that. You were always able. No, to we knew we always made it back. Yeah. Why do you? But but you said it did happen to a lot of people. Oh well, yeah, we on the statistics now, how many were shot down. Well, I, I think the uh, if, if I could, if I remember right, uh, there was a, there was twelve thousand BT B17s manufactured during the war. They kept bringing new ones over all the time. There's twelve thousand of them. Four thousand of them were shot down or or engine trouble on the mission. So four thousand. See, so that was one out of. Uh, 12,000, so that would be one out of four. Anyhow, that's how many were shot were shot down. And then, so you remember, and we, so if you figured that the early ones had 10 people in there, how many how many crew members that would be? And I think it, something like 50,000 were actually killed. Then the prisoner of war was a real great number, too. When you think about the fact that it didn't happen to you and your crew, yeah. Was it just a matter that the odds were in your favor, or were there things that you could do to evade being no, shot down? No, uh, we, we couldn't do nothing. Those are crew members. The pilots couldn't do too much evasive action when they was in formation either. Uh, they, they did do in the uh, fighter attacks. They did do a little, but you couldn't move because, you know, you only had so much room to, to move because the planes were that packed that tight together. Uh, so I, I always thought, you know, I, my luck, I, was, I just, uh, I never was worried too much about it. I, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because there's nothing I could do about it. The uh, only thing I did when the flak got real heavy, I'd spin the, I think if I'd spin the ball, it would deflect the, the, the flak. You know, I did hear some pings around because you could hear, 
Uh, the plane made so much noise, and, and, but I didn't feel the concussions of the exploding uh, bombs around you uh, more than what uh, you hear them because the plane was so noisy. You hear a little rumble with that, so uh, when you knew they was getting close. The, the, uh, the bomb could, uh, one of the anti aircraft shells could go off. Well, it was just like fireworks. It just, now it reminds me of fireworks when you see, when you see how far the sparks fly out around. Like, that was something like, like the anti aircraft uh, shells were exploding. And they, they say, well, there's lethal within, uh, well, 30, 30 to, uh, to 40 feet of, of, by one of them exploding. Shrapnel would fly out that far from one of them to be lethal that would make holes in your plane or could hit, knock your plane down. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, like I say, I just kind of, kind of winch and <laughs> nothing you could do. But it, oh, in fact, uh, the first, the first mission I went on, uh, about every mission we had an aircraft fire, we could tell when we going over the, the, the uh, German line or the line of the fighting men, you know, how far our troops were taking ground because they, we, we would get a little uh, an aircraft fire, a couple shots would come up then. Uh, but then the, f the first time when you're looking ahead, you could see a, you could see ahead and, and you knew you could see this all the, because when these bombs would explode in the air, they'd always leave a black a mark of powder, you know, uh, uh, you could see where there's one, sometimes it would look black, you know, you know you're going to have to fly directly through that. And the first time I seen that, it gives me, it did give me a chill through. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But uh, other than that, I never, I just never thought it was my time. It was my time. I was ready to go. You know, I, I made, I made peace with myself, and and I was, and, and never, I never was real scared. Mm -hmm. That was. It must have been different for everybody. This well, I, 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 yeah, we we had we had a little problem with the, in the plane one time, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, he was he was a new. Replacement because our pilot made a uh, lead pilot. And we had we had, our co-pilot took over, and then we had another uh, of pilot that flew, and and uh, and the, he gives a pilot trouble. He evidently what was happening. See, I was down there in, in the in the ball. I didn't over oh, whatever one thing I would know is what I'd hear over the intercom. What was happening, and uh, I, I heard him one time when we was getting hit, real going through bad. And the pilot. Told the engineer to get this guy out of here. I uh, heard later that he had we kind of went to pieces, uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but that, that never, you know, that happened after that. They were, we, like I say, we were, we were lucky. Like I say, I was lucky to get over there that late because uh, when the first ones went over there, they just basically flew until they were shot down. Uh, they didn't have much of a chance. But when I got over there, uh, then they put it down 25 missions then you got to go home so they give something to look forward to. So did you fly just 25 missions? I only got 23 of the wars. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, my crew did, but uh, I got a, I had ear problems. Uh, I tell you that before, but anyhow, uh, when I uh, couldn't hear, you know, the flight surgeon had me miss a couple missions uh, and they went to the flight surgeon. It was pretty crude at that time. Well, you, you know when you when you can't hear, you probably fly in an airplane enough, and when you hold your nose and blow a little bit, well, they put a rubber hose, air hose, and hold you, hold you, put it in your mouth and hold your nose, trying to trying to pop them back out. But well, that's about all they could do to get you. But but it was just a couple of missions where you know when you have a if you have a cold or anything, your sinus plugs up and you can't. So you did 23, and you were out because of the ear problems, and then yeah. by then. But then the war was over. War was when over. I was talking, well, the I, the I European flew. war was over. European, yeah. And then, then we got to come. Uh, we had enough, our crew got to come back. Some of our crews went on the Pacific if you didn't have enough missions in. But our crew had enough time and missions in that we got to come back to the States and just set the aside. <clears throat> uh, just wait the time out there until the war was over before we were discharged. Mm -hmm. And during all this time, were you writing home or writing to your brother? Uh, yeah. But, my wife Betty Jo, why well, she was right. She she's all right. I get a letter every day from her. She was back in Flanagan. Huh? Yeah, and she was. Well, she finished up high school, and then when I was in there, and, uh, and so she kept track of that, and she kept track of some of the letters, and and because uh, it was pretty well published, 
than what the Eighth Air Force was doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she cut out a lot of the things in the paper. But, and so we looked it up when I got home and I got some newspaper clippings of mm -hmm. telling about the raid that I happened to be on. Uh -huh. uh, so she, she's the one that kept up. The, otherwise, I wouldn't kept in a diary or nothing like that. And she's the one that kept up. And then they made the scrapbook and then had a niece put it in the scrapbook for him. And, and so that's why I got the record. So it was like the raids that you were on that was pretty much being followed back in the U.S. Yeah. You know, event by event. Yeah, yeah, there was. There was. And, and at that time, even, even the 8th Air Force would send out little clips about back to your hometown newspaper and really tell, really tell you a little bit what's happening. Uh, it tells you so many missions, uh, Sergeant Sergeant Oxford or, or that was on, had to be on a mission uh, on that rate. But we, weren't, we weren't allowed to write home anything about the missions or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. You couldn't be, a, could you say anything about what you were doing? Uh, no, we, 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 we went, I'd write home and I said, well, you can read about in the paper. That's about all I could say. Uh -huh. uh, so what would you write about? Uh, Probably tell our love there, yeah. <laughs> no, we really, really couldn't tell. I never, I never wrote. She always wrote uh, pretty good letters, but I, I didn't write that many myself back. But of course, whenever it was, and then even when we'd move out, the, the uh, army or the air force would send, send you what you, if you have been sent to someplace else, or to another address or something, they'd get give the, send home that information. Now you know the. The raids you went out on was that mostly during the day or at night? What's the best? Uh, I had the best in there. It was all early morning. All uh, <clears throat> that was one of the things. Well, that was one of the things. You'd get up when it was dark. The seal would come around and wake you up if the, he had the list of the people that fly. We 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 flew uh, we flew uh, three days and sat down and got one day off. Uh, <clears throat> So one, one, one squadron would sit down every day. Anyhow, uh, he come out in the morning, it was during about five o'clock in the morning, dark yet. He, he'd come and wake everybody up and shake you if you don't get out of bed and make sure that you got up. <clears throat> and we had, and he'd tell you what briefing time was, we had to go to pre-briefing. And we'd go to the mess hall first, and then after that we would go to the briefing room. You know, you've probably seen in the paper where there's a big map, show you where he was going to go that day. What you, where, you, where the fighters for, might be, or where you're going to get flak, and all this stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we would get out to the, take the truck to take it out to the, to the staging area. Out, it was just a big old farm place, farm field outside the air base where they had the planes scattered all over. See, they didn't put them all in planes so they, somebody couldn't come up and shoot them up. They'd, you know, disperse them all over the field. <clears throat> the trucks would trucks would take us out there and then then when we start <clears throat> uh, revving up there and get ready they have to take uh, ETO time uh, and then it would take us it would take probably till we could take off and form it'd be it had to be daylight of course uh, when you take off and then it would take a while before all these planes flying up there could form and get in their formation before we take off across the channel and we'd all be Hundreds of planes flying around in circles up there. Uh, it was okay if it was visually, but they had their, they'd have one lead plane out there where the other ones are supposed to catch up with, you know, to form. Uh, they had all the pilots had all that. <clears throat> but we got up a couple of times. It was a foggy and and it, it got pretty scary because the guys you'd see them <laughs> planes would whoosh by you this way and that way. Uh, how close it'd come to you trying to form, get in formation before we would take off across the channel. Because we'd always, we'd always be formed in a formation before we started across the channel. Uh, and that took quite a while uh, to do that. And we got our altitude and, well, we would get the altitude while we were forming our, our groups. <clears throat> now, the targets was, were you going to Germany or were you? Yeah, the most of uh, France. France and Germany. Uh, France and Germany. First, there was some in France. They around uh, later on. I mean, while well, the a lot of them along the Rhine River. Uh, how long? How long was was it to take to fly from from England to Germany? <clears throat> I'm not just too sure. I do know. I do know the missions were all the, the shortest mission was over six hours. 
That's six longest, hours there and back? Yeah, and the longest one was nine hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so that time we'd take off, I was in a, but I wouldn't, have to, I wouldn't have to get in the ball until we started across the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just being a bit in the ways far crawl down in the ball and, and go, start across the channel. So I'd be down, I'd be down a lot of times, seven, eight hours. You were always shooting at ground targets, or were you sometimes no, shooting? No, we, were, we, we, we weren't any strafing. We had a little strafing in practice, but we were, we were never, we never uh, the, the fighter planes done the strafing, and, and the, the fighter bombers uh, did the strafing, helped the ground crew. <clears throat> we, we didn't do any technical <clears throat> uh, bombing, like a, right ahead of the troops, except, though I, uh, like I say, the Battle of the Bulge, though we, we went in, uh, we did some uh, bombing there. But uh, other than that, why, it was all strategic uh, bombing factories and stuff like that. Okay, uh, yeah. and so your job in that case, tell me about exactly what your... Our job was just to deliver the bombs. Mm -hmm. And for you there in the gun turret? <laughs> was just protected from fighter planes. How often did they come by? The, after I was there, we only seen them a couple of times because we already, we like say we had enough fighter protection that uh, that they they kept them away from us. Uh -huh. So that that was that was a blessing. That's why by, by being getting over there that late, these these first guys, they didn't have protection. You know they they were they were fighting these fighter planes all the way in the target and all the way back. Of course, they wouldn't be when they go over the target. The, Fighter planes wouldn't follow them over the target because they wouldn't go through that flak. But as soon as you come back out on the way home, back, back across France or going to, the, that's when they would attack. Yeah. And so, were, were there some times when, 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 when fighter planes came on the attack and you had to? I never, I never, I, only, I never fired at a, at a, at a, a, a plane. Uh, but a couple of times I was ready to, uh, and well, in fact, I was there to, late enough in the, in the war that I seen the jet, the first jet that Sherman set up. Uh, he come up into our formation and nobody knew what it was. Uh, <laughs> until we read, read later on that they had, they had these fighters, but he, he, never, he never fired, well, we never have a chance to fire at him anyhow. No, no, I was, I, uh, my, uh, as far as being in danger, it wasn't from the fighter planes, it was the, and the aircraft. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And Which kept getting worse as, as we, as it pulled the guns back. Was that something that you could fire at? No, end? no, no. Okay. So you were just, you were just hanging there. Right. No, we just belonged for the ride most of the time. Um, the, the incident you mentioned where the engines failed. Were yeah. They, they, had, was that because of 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 the air of of, of the air, any aircraft? Yeah. Okay. So they they were shooting at you. Right. And and like I say, they kept getting worse as a Berlin was really they really had the guns there, you know. And we lost quite a few planes from any aircraft. Uh, in fact, the uh, fact of mission, we call about collateral damage, it, and it bothered it bothered me a little bit at the time. And in fact, it bothered the, in, the officers, briefing officers that morning, because this was towards the end of the war, and the people, civilians were trying to get out of Berlin. And we, our mission was bomb the marshaling yards, the trains going out, and he. They actually told us there would be a lot of casualties, civilian casualties, because of the bombing that railroad yard and the, all the civilians. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many thousands was, was killed on that. So, so that, that had to be a concern. But uh, nothing you do, you know, it's just like, they'd, like they are today, how many civilians, you know, how, of course, people around here know, are, I know about it and get all worked up about it, but this is something that happens in war. <laughs> you just saw it as being unavoidable. Right, it's, it's, it's a collateral damage, I guess you call it. You were, now, how, how, how often, like how many missions would you go on a week? Uh, well, let's see, I went on 23 altogether. We would go, well, like, like I say, we, we'd go three and then sit down one, we'd go, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do over probably three, four, four maybe a week. Mm -hmm. about, that was about what it so would not be. So not much downtime? Uh, well, no, we, we got to go into London quite often okay. uh, for a weekend. 
uh, and you know, well, it wouldn't be weekends. It would be time that we got pretty well acquainted in in London. What was that like on you know being an American soldier in London? It, it, well, it was pretty good. Uh, we had we we went to the uh, the CEO club. I mean, I'm not the CEO that the officer club, but we 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 had the other clubs and the dances and everything like that. And in fact, I had a girlfriend over there. I met well, the second time. And this was kind of an interesting thing too, because it was the inter later part of the war, and uh, and remember the Japanese already had taken into Man Manchuria, and and uh, was already going into the China and that, and uh, well, I met a, <clears throat> a, a a lady that well, she was pretty young yet, but she was married, but she she was living over in uh, in Malaysia, and and she was married to an Englishman. And she was pretty well to do. They had a uh, rubber plantation. So uh, over there in, in Malaysia, well, when the Japanese come through, they just had enough time to get the women and children out on boats. They send them over and brought them back to London. Or her husband stayed over there, but she never heard again from him. You know, they, they didn't have it. When the Japanese, they didn't have any. Civilians or who, if there's an Englishman, they they just killed them. So uh, I got acquainted with her, you know. Uh, and then when I'd <clears throat> go back, why well, then I'd, I'd see her and we'd go out and go through the parks in London and things like that. Now, had you she, already met Betty Jo? Betty? Oh yeah, you know. In fact, I showed her Betty Jo's picture. She's <laughs> <laughs> so there was a, that understanding as far. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, she was. She was Betty Jo dated a little bit too. I think when I was gone. So. It wasn't nothing. Yeah. We didn't get engaged until after I got back. <clears throat> I guess that was always that was always a question for some people. I guess who were. Well, yeah. Who who might have been engaged or were close to getting engaged? They thought. <laughs> yeah. I think. Do we have to change tape? Yeah. Okay. That would be a good time. To <laughs>